But I'll go ahead and give you the title. We're going to be in Luke 7, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. And I've entitled this morning's sermon, The Comforter in Catastrophe. The Comforter in Catastrophe. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, let us all come now with a great spirit of expectation and anticipation, maybe to the level of what your disciples felt when they walked with you on this earth, knowing as they walk with you that it was only moments that you would actively perform in your earthly ministry, that you would display the power, the compassion, the love, the grace, the mercy, and the forgiveness of God in what you did on this earth. We thank you for those lives you've intersected and transformed through healing, through deliverance, through rescue. Father, th we have experienced these same everyday miracles. I pray that our lives would be one that would reflect that and that we would live every, every day not in pessimism but optimism that you're going to do something great. You are a good, gracious, powerful, loving God who walks with us every day of our lives and ultimately no matter what tomorrow brings, no matter how difficult they may be, that we know you'll meet us with the compassion and the love that only the Comforter can give us, the one you left us, the Holy Spirit, our helper. Bless this, your word now. Prepare us to receive it. We love you, Lord. We want to hear from you. So now you take over. Would you speak to us? In Jesus' name, amen. If I said the name Hudson Taylor, some of you would know who I'm talking about. And if you don't, uh, he's a very famous uh, missionary from many years ago. It was him, his wife, and his children who went over to mainland China, and they uh, did Christian ministry there, putting their own lives in peril. Uh, and you'll find out some of what happened in a moment. But in the midst of Hudson Taylor's uh, ministry, he had already lost two children while he was a missionary, and then he lost his wife, and he wrote these words. I cannot describe to you my feelings. I do not understand them myself. I feel like a person stunned with a blow or recovering from a faint and is yet but partially conscious. My father has ordered it, so therefore I know it is, it must be, best. And I thank him for so ordering it. I feel utterly crushed. Oftentimes my heart is nigh to breaking. But at that point, I had almost said I never knew what peace and happiness were before. So much have I enjoyed in the very sorrow. How many of us can say that? How much I've enjoyed in the very sorrow. And yet, what Hudson Taylor learned is in the catastrophes of life. It's a time in which the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, comes. He meets adversity with his power, his love, his plan for our lives. And no matter how overwhelming and mountainous those situations and circumstances can be, certainly loss of a loved one can be a catastrophe in the heart of a mother, of a father, of a family, of a friend. It is not greater than God's comfort. It is not greater than God's love. And we'll learn that this morning. I heard another story of a pastor in Oregon who had lost his wife in a car accident. Later, he lost his daughter. Later still, he almost lost his son and daughter in another car accident. He didn't lose them, but it was a miracle they survived. Then recently, he almost lost his eldest son to an intestinal disease. In all of these tragedies and tests of his life, he had been able to come through them with joy. People said to him, oh, you're in shock. It would be healthy if you cried a bit. He says that the only way he can explain it is that God gave him the strength he needed at the just the right time to make it through those tragedies. He relied on the promise of Jesus to comfort him with the Holy Spirit. He was given a peace that passes understanding. In every trial that comes his way, he just remembers that God is good and that God is sovereign. He relies on the Holy Spirit to comfort him as Jesus promised. This pastor does not seek sympathy from men, but comfort from God. Amen. How powerful, how powerful. What a reminder to us that no matter what adversities we face or what we go through, that God is ever 
there, we as believers have been given the precious, wonderful gift of a miraculous divine helper, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And so it's important that we recognize in the Greek, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, is there living inside of us today. The very Spirit of Jesus, the one we will read of today, the one who brings the dead back to life to bring comfort to a mother who is destitute, who is tragically isolated and alone. She will find out, in fact, that truly, if you're a child of God, you are never alone. Because it is God's promise, what? That he will never leave us or forsake us. Now, how can he make such a lavish promise? It's simple when you realize that God left the Holy Spirit to dwell in his people, to be there with them, to love them, to carry them through the hardest times of life. I've often told people, the Holy Spirit has been given us to help us to do the things we don't want to do. Some days, I'm sure many of you feel it, especially on a Monday morning, the drudgery of life. Groundhog Day, time to get up, the alarm clock goes off, the week begins, and what will it bring? Certainly the same woes of the week before. I'll go to work to a boss who I can't make happy, to earn a wage that's never enough, to probably get a flat, to get sick, to never have enough, to trudge through life, and always have to deal with tragedy and trouble. But God has always been honest with us, hasn't he? He said, in this world you'll have trial, you'll have tribulation, you'll have trouble. But he gave us the antidote, a way of thinking, right? He said, but be of good cheer. Why? For I have overcome the world. This isn't it. And we are not left comfortless. We are never alone. No matter how life gets, hard it gets, no matter how uncertain they are, are anxious, right? That's a big thing today. Everyone's anxious, right? I got a little anxious driving up here today. I left the Revere Church a little bit later than I normally do. I looked at the clock and I went, oh no, <laughs> this won't work. <laughs> How am I going to get up there on time? And you know what occurred to me? I said, I'm going to get up there on time like I, every other time I did. <laughs> you know, I've never been late for a service. I was told by others that, Pastor, you're well-intentioned, but trying to be a pastor of two churches in two different states, do you know that's not possible? And I agreed with them. I said, you know, it's not. But this is what God is, the position I'm in. I'm not willing to let go of the loved ones he's given me to care over and revere, and I'm not willing to forfeit the love of those who will come and are there to love in Seabrook. I won't. God, you'll have to choose which one you want me to let go of. And you know what God proved to me? He said, neither. I'm going to give you the strength to be in two places at once. And he does. And week after week, whether winter, spring, summer, or fall, traffic or no traffic, I arrive here on time to deliver the word of God and worship. You know, sometimes, you know, I have enough time to actually wait till 20 past or 25 or 11, even 11.30. I can get here just to preach. But God knows me. I want to worship you, Lord. We have a wonderful worship team, and I want to come, and I want to worship and inhabit the praises of the people. I want to be in the midst of that. And he always lets me get here to enjoy that too because that's the God that he is, and that's what he can do. But we learn through life experience and in the word of God this morning that it is in the midst of great pain and loss then there can also be a sense of great joy and peace never before experienced. It's all a part of our supernatural journey. God wants to learn us to learn about a God who can do the what? The impossible. He wants us to learn that he's a supernatural God. He's not a statue. He's not a hope so. He's, will, he's not a we'll see what happens, Right? Isn't that what we tell our kids and our grandchildren? Can we do this? Can we do that? We'll see. <laughs> With God, it's not we'll see. It's my will be done. Amen. No matter what. No matter who. 
And the enemy is great, but he's not greater than the God who loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. So I wanted to ask you this morning, are you filled with an expectation this morning that you will learn about a great and powerful Jesus again? I'm very sure Jesus' disciples had this expectation, anticipation, while they followed Jesus. They witnessed him do supernatural miracle upon, we've been going through the miracles of Jesus. And, and think about those who followed him. They must have been constantly in their heart and minds, what's next? What's he going to do next? <laughs> he's, he's speaking people to life, to healing. Blind are seeing, lepers are being healed. And we're following what's next. I can't wait to see what he does next. Do we live that way? We should live that way. Not thinking that we'll maybe just get by or just get through. With anticipation, no matter how deep the hole or how lost the soul, that God will make a way. I love that song, God will make a way, where there seems to be no way. God will make a way. I'm sure those Israelites looked at the Red Sea with the enemy breathing down and coming to destroy them. There was no way. But God made a way, didn't he? Simple. He just opened the sea and left the ground dry so they could walk through it. And then tricked the enemy to follow, only to be destroyed to protect the people of God. God will always make a way. Is that how you live today? Is that how you think today? Even though with your feeble mindset and my feeble mindset and our limited capacity to understand that God can always do more than we can ask or think, can, can we just let ourselves, even for right now, believe that God's bigger and greater than what we can ever imagine? And no matter what you must overcome today, it's nothing for God. He's not going to just get you over the hill. He's not going to get just get you over the hill. He's going to take you past it. So we pick up the story. Jesus, uh, let me give you a little foreground. He, he just left the centurion whose slave was sick. Remember the centurion comes to him, says, uh, Jesus, my, my, my slave is sick. He's near to death. I know if you just say the word, he'll be healed. And Jesus marvels at his faith. He explains to Jesus, I'm a man of authority. When I tell my men to go, they go. When I tell my men to come, they come at my word. And I know that you have the same authority but greater. So if you just say the word, I know that my slave will be healed. And Jesus marveled. Jesus' brain was blown. Wow. He, he, can you imagine his expression? The man like, what did you just say? You don't think that I have to come and actually touch him or do anything? That just at my word, he'll be healed? And the centurion told him, yes, that's what I believe. I believe you're that powerful because you're God. And Jesus said, your faith has healed him. Go, and he will be healed. And he was and, 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 and the people who are following Jesus, this crowd, they've just experienced this, and they're all amazed. And they're all filled with joy and expectation. Do, do you, can you just believe that? When word got back, that yeah, in fact, his servant was healed just because Jesus said so. Doesn't that fly in the face of the faith healers of, of today who make a big show, right? They put on the suit, right? Get the big band and get everyone all amped up and tell people to come on down and they play the music and they flash the lights and the smoke and, and then they slap someone in the forehead and they kick the man out of the wheelchair. Right? Ooh. Whoo. He can walk. He can walk. He can see. Sadly, just a show of man's deceit. And man sin. But with Jesus, there was no show. There was just love and power. And all he did was say the word. No show. Because all he cared about was not what people would think. It's what that man would think of God being healed. 
That's where the power is. So it says in verse 11, so uh, Luke 7, 11, soon afterward, this is after this, this great event, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, but not only them, a large crowd followed him. And at that moment, a funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. So you've got these two extremes that are going to converge. You've got one large group of people that are filled with this expectation and joy and this party atmosphere. They're exuberant. They're joyous and what Jesus just, just did, and they're expecting the next great moment for what Jesus is going to do. Everyone's laughing and having a good time, and they come and they meet up and converge with this other group of people. But there's a whole different thing going on there. The other crowd is filled with grief, destitute, mourning, alone, death. So you can imagine the picture, right? Pretty awkward, right? Everyone's laughing and singing, and, and all of a sudden they see the casket, and they hear the mourners crying because they've been paid to do that, and they're crying loud, and the pain and the, and the facial expression of those, and especially the mother, the widow will learn to add to her pain. And these two clash. They come together. And you can imagine those, those joys, joyous shouts and laughter and, and, and wide open eyes, they all instantly simmer down because they recognize that this is not a time for us to be celebrating when someone has experienced such great loss. And so everything quiets down. But it's an awkward moment, right? It kind of reminds me what happens when you go to a funeral, right? You come from work, got to go to a wake after work. You've worked all day, stopped and got a drive through sandwich. You're on the way to the wake. You're living life. You're doing what you got to do. You pick up a phone call from a friend, makes a joke, you laugh. And then you walk into the funeral and you go from this to... And you walk up to the surviving family of the lost loved one, and you say, what do we say? And then we're, I'm so sorry for your loss. Right? We leave our lives, and we just flick the switch, and all of a sudden, we just come into this awkward moment where we say, I'm so sorry for your loss. And, and what we're trying to do is enter into that with them, right? We're trying, but can we? Can we show up at a funeral in which a widow who already lost her husband, now loses her only son. Can we relate at that moment? Really? Truly? I mean, we put the frown on. We may be in deep sorrow and even shed a tear because we, we kind of think about that, and we're like, oh boy, this is pretty heavy. A and we walk up to the person, and we say, we're so, so sorry for your loss. And, and it's just so uncomfortable, and it's so awkward, but that's what happens at funerals. Our beloved brother Darren down in the Revere Church, who happens to have my name, he passed away, as you guys know, a few weeks ago after a long struggle with kidney cancer, our kidney disease. And um, I was there at the wake, and, and I was there at the funeral, and I was given an opportunity to speak at the funeral. And I recalled a, a joyous time uh, in Darren's life as he helped minister with us in, in the Revere Church at the Harvest Party. Uh, as we were having a pre-planning meeting for the harvest party, uh, Darren mentioned, why don't we have a dunk tank? And, uh, geez, everyone thought that was a great idea. And I said, that's a great idea, Darren. And uh, who's going to be the dunkie? You? And uh, he said, yeah, I'll do it. And I said, good, great. We got a dunk tank and we got a dunkie all set. So we rented a dunk tank. October 31st came. A frigid October 31st night. We filled that tank with warm water? No. <laughs> Cold water. And we get to about an, within an hour of the event starting, and I start to notice, you know, Darren's not feeling so good. Half hour before, Darren's not good at all. I'm so sorry, Pastor, I have to go. I cannot. I cannot do this. I, I, I need to go home. I'm not feeling well. He was experiencing some of that kidney failure which lingered for years, to be honest with you guys, was terrible. And, um, sorry, Pastor, I have to go. I said, okay, don't worry, just, we want you well, go home. So, we needed a new donkey, and that was me. <laughs> and, um, as I was speaking at the, 
at the funeral, I, there was a moment there where the grief turned to joy when I told the story of how appreciative I was and how, how one day in heaven when I see Darren, because he was a believer, I know he's in heaven, that I would pick, had a bone to pick with him. You know, that dunk tank, that wasn't such a good idea, especially when you didn't do it. <laughs> that night I was freezing. And you know, Roger Clemens showed up. <laughs> I mean, it was unbelievable. The kids in this neighborhood, they were all like baseball experts. Yeah, man, you got a kid with the wind-up going, boom, boom, I'm in the water. Next kid, he was Roger Cousins' cl- uh, cousin. Boom, I'm in the water. Boom, I'm in the water. These kids were like, they couldn't miss. I'm like, what is going on, Lord? <laughs> this isn't right. But they had a ball, and they loved it. And I'm sure those kids never will forget that night where they got to dunk the pastor over and over and over and over. I got so cold. I I actually almost got a little pneumonia after that, which God protected me, made me well. But uh, that night, was I was like, oh, that Darren. (laughs) And at the funeral, I said, you know, so I got a little bone to pick with him, and, and everyone laughed, and there was joy for a moment. But after that stop, the reality of what's going on, the loss of a loved one, in its permanence to an unbelieving crowd brought the sorrow back. And then I was able to speak about a relationship that, Jesus, that, that Darren had with Jesus Christ. And that because of that, his death, in fact, wasn't a penalty, it was a reward. He got to go to be in paradise with Jesus. No pain, no death, no sorrow. All of it gone. No more funerals. No more kidney problems, no more back aches, no more knee problems. Okay, now I'm talking about me. No more anxiety. That all passes away, and what's left is paradise with Jesus. And something amazing happened, and I believe in authentic work of the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter. We went to the bereavement after me and my wife, and we sat at the, not the head table with the immediate family, but we sat with cousins and aunts and uncles, and um, I started to notice a spirit of joy at the table. I started talking about other things, and they were asking me questions, and just it was a great opportunity for me to minister. And I looked over at the head table, I looked at, at Darren's mother and father and his brother and his nieces and nephews who were at that table, and you know what I saw? A peace that passes all understanding. A joy. And at first, I, I, I was stunned by it. I, it almost felt betray. I almost felt like betrayal. Like, how can we be in this spirit? Shouldn't we? We should all be crying and grieving still. And then God spoke to me. He said, "No, Darren. They believe what you told them. Because of Darren's faith, he's in paradise, and they can have joy now." And I have done that. And I smiled. Because I recognized that was the authentic work of the comforting of the Holy Spirit. You see, the truth set them free to have joy, even in the midst of sorrow, where there was isolation and death and pain. It was all taken away by the truth of what the Holy Spirit taught that day at the funeral. I only had about 10 minutes to speak. And in that 10 minutes, God gave me the power, the words to articulate in a, com- in a committed, confident way that Darren secured eternity with Jesus and that he was not to be mourned. He was to be revered. And even a sense of jealousy should be in all of our hearts because he gets to be in paradise today. And they believed it. How do I know that? Because where there was death and destitution and pain, it was replaced with joy. And that's what we're going to see here. That's what's going on. These these two extremes converge, and look what happens. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord saw her, this is Jesus, his heart overflowed with compassion. Think about this for a second. She's a widow, and her only son died. What does that mean? She already lost her husband, which would have been how she was provided for. In that day, 
women weren't working, don't, didn't work. Men earned. They were the head of the home. They earned. And it was up to the father and the son to work and earn to provide for the family. She had lost all of her ability to survive. Her husband died. Now she had some recourse and help in that her son would go to work and provide. And now he's gone. You know what's left for her, her future? To become a beggar. That she would have no husband, no son, no way to, to provide for herself. Her way of employment at that point in her life would have been to become a beggar. To sit out and ask people to give her money every day so that she could eat and survive. That was her future. Not only a broken heart, but a broken future. Nothing to look forward to except hard tragedy. Now, if this isn't tragic, I don't know what is. You know, some of us might be sitting here to say, today and saying, I'm complaining about the things I'm complaining about. She's lost everything. Here's the most amazing thing. It doesn't say at that point that this widow came to Jesus and said, Jesus, you're healing everybody. My son's dead. Where were you? I need your help. I need you to do something for me. Do you see that in the scripture? No. No words. No complaint. No petition. Does that change what Jesus does? No. Because he's not responding to her words. He's responding to her need. And when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion, it says in the New Living Translation. His love can't help but to be poured out. Do you ever overfill a glass? My grandchildren love to get themselves a glass of something, and they'll grab the biggest jug, and their little hands can barely hold the weight, and they start to go, gloop, 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 and I know what's coming. Gloop, gloop, gloop. Because they can't control the weight and they pour too much and it overflows. What can you do to stop it, right? Once, it, once they get to that last gloop, it's overflowing the glass. And if you tried to hang on to it, it would just overflow your hands. There's going to be a mess. Because that, that's going to that's be all poured out and, and, and spill out everywhere. And that's what we see in the compassion in the heart of God. It overflowed. His love and power overflowed into this woman's life, and he's going to lavish her, lavish her with his love and his power and his comfort. Don't miss this, that, that the, Lord, the Lord saw. Don't miss that, that God knows, Jesus knows, God sees. He knows that she already lost her husband. He knows that she already... She just lost her only son. He knows exactly where he is. But now look at how he's going to respond to her. It's almost scandalous. It almost seems cruel. He says to her, don't cry. Don't cry. Stop crying. Doesn't that sound unreasonable? Wait a minute. I just lost, I lost my husband. I'm a widow. And I lost my only son. And you're telling me not to cry? Why would you do that, God? How am I expected to not cry? At this moment, think back to when Jesus is going to leave his disciples right before his crucifixion. We go to John 13, verses 31 through 36. Listen to this. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, also, listen, this is where he lets them know. I shall be with you a little while longer. You will see me, as I have said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, and you should also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then Simon Peter says what we would all say, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. He's talking about 
the cross. Jesus was, was preparing them. I'm leaving. I'm going to die on the cross for all of creation, that their sins would be forgiven. I will be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm going to do the greatest thing a man can do. I'm going to lay down my life for all men who trust in me will be saved through my death. And they're bewildered. And they're fearful. And they're afraid. But Jesus says to them in verse John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Do you hear that? Let not your heart be troubled. Do you hear like, don't cry? Don't be troubled. Don't be fearful. Don't cry. Don't, Jesus says to them. So when he says don't cry to this woman, this is very familiar. Again, where does this come from? Look at John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Later on, here is what Jesus helps us to know about how we're expected not to cry, how we're expected not to be fearful and overwhelmed. John 14, 25, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all things that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Don't worry. Don't cry. Neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you will rejoice because I said I am going to the Father. For my father is greater than I. Jesus said, tells them, don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Don't cry. Why? Because I'm not leaving you, is what he's telling them. I'm going to be with you. You won't see me because I'm going to live inside of you. (laughs) I'm going to get closer to you. You're not losing me. You're gaining more of me. 24-7, I will live inside of you. I will be with you always. In every circumstance, in every moment, you will never be alone. And so when you hear Jesus tell this woman not to cry, he's saying it because he has compassion upon her. (coughs) And he doesn't want her to be fearful. So he tells her, don't cry. Why? Because he's going to comfort her. The same way we hear the voice of God that says, don't cry today. Don't be fearful. Don't worry. I'm with you. As long as I'm with you, don't be afraid. And then the miracle. Without any request from this woman, it's all the heart of God. Verse 14, then he walked over to the coffin and he touched it. Mind you, When he did that, he defiled himself. Leviticus uh, 21, verses 1 through 12, tell us that that a a spiritual man, a holy man of God, was never supposed to touch a dead body. It defiled him. And so Jesus touching the coffin meant that he defiled himself at that moment. But he doesn't care because he's more concerned with this woman's need, her sorrow. His compassion being poured out on her was more important. And so he touched the coffin, and the bearers stopped instantly, the ones carrying it. And then he spoke, young man, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up, and he began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. The boy sat up, and he started to talk. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what he said. What did he say? God just brought him back to life. He was dead. Talk about after life, after death experiences. I don't know what he said, but I'm I'm thinking he said, I was dead, but I saw you. And I saw you come and saying, sorry, (laughs) you can't stay. You're going to go back and take care of your mother. And he said, okay, how are you going to do that? And then he opened his eyes and he went, oh, that's how you're going to do it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know what he said. But I wouldn't be surprised if he said what I just said. (laughs) 
It was great where I was, but if you have more work for me to do on this earth to console and supply and provide for my mother, I'm ready, Lord. Here am I. And he sat up and he began to talk and he gave him back to his mother and you can only, exp- you can only imagine what she felt, the comfort she felt, right? You think she was comforted? Of course she was. Verse 16 There's going to be two wonderful consequences that come as a result of this miracle. Great fear swept over the crowd. Not fear of God, but fear of the power of God. They were in awe of it. Wait a minute, Jesus. You can bring people back from the dead? I mean, we've seen you heal people and make sick people well, but now you can just bring people back to life? They're stunned. There's great fear over that they're in the midst of God. The other consequence was they glorified God. They praised God saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people today and the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and and the surrounding countryside. It's so important for us to remember this morning that God is with us that he's in us. And here's the thing that we should never lose sight of. God is for us. Walk out the doors of this church today and expect that a loving God who lives inside of you is with you to comfort you and whatever this day brings or this week brings. The same God that's brought you through whatever you've gone through up to this point is the God who will continue to carry you and lead you. Because he's the God of all comfort. There's nothing too hard for God. We learn over and over and over again. And sometimes the greatest obstacle in a Christian's life is their own doubt. It's you, it's me. It's not God. He's not powerless. There's no deficiency there whatsoever. Because he's the God of all comfort. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, We just thank you so much for the power and the truth of the word of God that we hear from you. Each and every week, Lord, we come with an expectation to hear of the next miracle that we'll learn that you did on the earth. We know those miracles are still happening today, Lord, in our lives, maybe in different geographical places and in different emotional realities, but you are truly the God of all comfort. And we thank you for the fact that you've given us the Holy Spirit Spirit, your very spirit, the spirit of our beloved Savior Jesus who lives inside of us every day, who walks with us. Help us to never forget that, Lord, how often we do when life gets hard. We don't know what this week will bring, but we know that you are in control and that we can trust you, that you are trustworthy, that that your compassion never fails, it fails not. And that mercy is afresh and new every morning. I thank you for, for what you've been doing in each of our lives, Lord. And I thank you for even the miracle of such wonderful worship today. We know Satan tried to hinder and stop that. And we're so grateful for the miracle of healing and what you did, Lord. I thank you for each soul, every person here this morning, handpicked by you to be here, not by accident, that they would hear again about a God who brings comfort, a God who who can empathize, a God who can, can step into our shoes and know what we know. Father, you are a God who, who's willing to take on our pain. We're so, loved, we're so filled with gratitude this morning for you, Lord. We love you so much. Would you walk with us today and let the confident experience of, of what you do in our lives, let that overflow into the lives of those we interact with this week, this day, that they might find out about a God of comfort that they can have too. Bless everyone now, Lord, as we leave this place. Continue to work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. God bless you.